Good evening. On behalf of the Carl F. H. Henry Center for Theological Understanding, it's my privilege to welcome you all here this evening um, for a, what I'm sure will be an informative and I'm sure will be a very lively uh, exchange. I'll turn this to Professor Chris Firestone as the moderator of tonight's debate in just a moment. But before that, I'm going to ask that we uh, start things as we do here at Trinity and as we should here at Trinity, and that is with prayer. So let's pray together. Well, great and gracious God, we give you thanks for this evening, for this time we have together to reflect upon your ways in our fallen world. We ask, Lord, that you will help us better to understand who we are and how you act. And we pray, Lord, that you will help us better to understand you, not just for the sake of mere understanding alone, but that we, our hearts will join in prayer with St. Anselm when he asked that we may know you better and that knowing you better, we may love you more and that loving you more, we may hate the sin from which you have redeemed us. And these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to the spring 2016 installment of the Trinity Debates on the campus of Trinity International University. Thank you all for making the trek here to the ATO Chapel for this special event, and thank you all for the uh, people who are online watching us. Um, glad that you are here. I am Dr. Chris Firestone, a professor of philosophy at Trinity College. I've served as a regular moderator of these debates since their inception 14 years ago. And as you can see, the Henry Center has done another wonderful job at putting this thing together. Thank you to Jeffrey Fulkerson and Tom McCall and the rest of the staff at the Henry Center for uh, getting behind these debates. I think they're a real service to the church and the community. So I'm, I'm glad they've done that again this year. In recent uh, years, Christianity has been attacked in many creative ways. For example, it has been under the verbal assault of naturalists who employ modified forms of logical positivism to challenge Christian truth claims about the existence of God, the origin of life, and the nature of life after death. Postmodern moral relativists have challenged objective ethics by arguing that the moral law in whatever form is merely one among many cultural constructions uh, rooted in compromises that humans make to promote their personal sense of well-being. There have also been new versions of the old attacks by atheists and agnostics trying to use the problem of evil or the problem of God's hiddenness as evidence for the non-belief in God. One recent criticism gaining traction, and indeed the topic of tonight's debate, has uh, played upon the supposed discontinuity between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament, with particular reference to God's actions in the Old Testament through his chosen people. While, God, while the God of the New Testament is a living, forgiving, and gracious God, the Old Testament God orders people of Israel to uh, wipe out entire people groups, such as in Deuteronomy 20, 16 through 18, where God promises to give the land of the locals to his people as their inheritance. In the midst of this promise, he commands them to obliterate everything in their path. Quote, you shall not leave, any, uh, leave alive anything that breathes. As we will see in the papers tonight, these challenges are not new. They go back to the early church and rise again from time to time to challenge us all to search the scriptures and explore other Christian writings. We ourselves to give an answer for the hope that is within us. With this in mind, rather than put together a debate tonight between an antagonist to the Christian faith and a single proponent of the Christian faith, we decided to invite a range of scholars from various territories within the Christian realm in order to hear several perspectives on this difficult topic. What we have for you tonight, then, is less, the, less of a knockdown, down drag out debate and more of a prelude or a prolegomena to a debate, an opportunity for Catholic, Orthodox, and Evangelical voices to be heard 
on this topic so that together we can better understand the full range of possibilities for addressing Christianly the topic of divine action, human suffering, and the Old Testament. The group we have assembled uh, to help us address this topic is certainly qualified. To be clear about how we will proceed, each person has been asked to give a 15-minute paper on the topic from his professional and confessional perspective and by focusing on one or another aspect of this very large question. Each person will then have five minutes to respond to the other papers, and then we will turn the time over to questions uh, um, from the audience and from the online community. The Henry Center staff will be collecting these questions twice tonight, once towards the, uh, the end of the fourth uh, paper, and then again uh, at the end of the response time, and that'll give us our collection of questions these will be uh, sorted, and I will then offer up some of the questions to the panelists in the Q&A section uh, of the, of the uh, debate. All right, well, let me get right to uh, introducing our participants tonight. Uh, you want to hear them and not me on this topic. I'm going to introduce them in reverse order so that when I get to our first speaker, he will then begin. First of all, um, or lastly, since I'm doing them in reverse order, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Dr. Paul Gavriliuk uh, is a Ukrainian American Orthodox theologian, philosopher, and historian. He holds the Aquinas Chair of Theology and Philosophy at the University of St. Thomas, where he has taught since 2001. His research interests include patristic doctrines of God, especially the rehabilitation of such unpopular divine attributes as simplicity and impassibility. Christology, spiritual perception, and the 20th century uh, and 20th century Orthodox theology. Translated into 10 languages, his most recent works include a monograph on George Florovsky's and the Russian uh, religious renaissance, and a collection of essays co-edited with Sarah Coakley, The Spiritual Senses, Perceiving God in Western Christianity. Today's talk, entitled Three Patristic Views of Divine Anger Management, in the Old Testament, builds on the argument of his earlier monograph, The Suffering of the Impassable God, The Dialectics of Patristic Thought. Please uh, join with me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Paul Gavrilio. <laughs> Dr. Matthew Levering is Perry Family Foundation Professor of Theology at Mundelein Seminary here in Libertyville, co-director of the Chicago Theological Initiative and director of the Center for Scriptural Exegesis, Philosophy, and Doctrine. He has previously served as professor of theology at the University of Dayton and associate professor of theology at Ave Maria University. He is the author, editor, or translator of over 30 books. Some of his most recent books include Proofs of God, from Tertullian to Karl Barth, Paul in the Summa Theologia, The Theology of Augustine, and Jesus and the Demise of Death. He has co-authored the book Natural Law, a Jewish Christian Islamic Trialogue. His interests include dogmatic and historical Catholic theology, Thomas Aquinas, biblical and ecumenical theology, philosophical reflection on God, and Vatican II. Please join with me in giving a warm Trinity welcome to Dr. Matthew Levering. <laughs> Dr. Dennis McGarry is chairman of and professor in the Department of Old Testament and Semitic Languages at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. Dr. McGarry received the Bachelor of Arts from Fort Wayne Bible College, the Master of Divinity from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, and the, Master of, uh, and the Master of Arts and the Doctor of Philosophy in Hebrew and Semitic Studies um, from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Dr. McGarry's publications include chapters contributed to Seeking Out the Wisdom of the Ancients, which he also co-edited, and Preaching the Old Testament. His most, uh, his most uh, recent co-edited book, Do Historical Matters Matter to Faith? A Critical Appraisal of Modern and Postmodern Approaches to Scripture. 
He is also editor for the series Studies in Biblical Hebrew. Dennis and his wife, Pamela, reside in Vernon Hills. They have three married children, nine grandchildren. Please uh, join me in welcoming Trinity's own Dr. Dennis McGarry. And finally, and leading off of our papers tonight, Dr. Paul Copan is professor of philosophy and ethics and the uh, uh, Pledger family chair at Palm Beach Atlantic University. Among many other articles and books, he is the author of Loving Wisdom, Christian Philosophy of Religion, and is, and is God a Moral Monster, Making Sense of the Old Testament God. He has co-authored with William Lane Craig, Making Sense uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, I'm sorry, with William Lane Craig, Creation Out of Nothing, a biblical, philosophical, and scientific exploration. Also co-edited with Craig, uh, Passionate Conviction and Contending with Christianity's Critics. He has co-edited multiple books on the historical Jesus and philosophy of religion and is presently working on another on warfare in the Old Testament. He regularly speaks at university campuses, at conferences, and to church groups. Paul and his wife, Jacqueline, have six children, and they reside in West Palm Beach, Florida. Join me in welcoming him and his first paper here this morning to Trinity. <laughs> this is this evening. Thank you. Good evening. <clears throat> the prominent public atheist Richard Dawkins contentiously calls the God of the Old Testament the most unpleasant character in all fiction, and we are by now familiar with his lengthy adjectival invective. Not that Dawkins is the ideal springboard for discussion, as even fellow atheists find many of his arguments shallow and ignorant. For instance, philosopher Michael Ruse states that Dawkins' book, The God Delusion, makes me embarrassed to be an atheist. Though many of us will find Dawkins' description problematic, we can still acknowledge that the God of the Old Testament uh, has been a challenge and even a stumbling block for many, for the faithful and infidels alike. Here are a couple of notable Old Testament passages that prompt such a reaction, a text I'll address later on. Uh, Only the cities of these peoples that the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance, you shall not leave alive anything that breathes, but you shall utterly destroy them, Deuteronomy 20. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has and do not spare him, but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey, uh, for Samuel 15. How might we, who are teaching and leading within the Christian community and seminaries, ser- seminarians here who are preparing to do so, guide those in our sphere of influence? What kinds of answers or possible fruitful lines of thinking can we offer to help them navigate through these challenging waters about the problem of evil and suffering and divine action in the Old Testament? As an evangelical analytic philosopher who also engages in apologetics, I wanted to draw a few strands together as we deal with pitfalls as well as promising ways forward. But alas, I can only condense and summarize here, but let us proceed with unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, and majestic instancy. First, although atheists tend to voice the loudest complaints against the moral monster God of the Old Testament, their own worldview has no metaphysical place for evil or good. I speak to audiences on the God of the Old Testament frequently, and and some of them are unsympathetic and know only jarring, harsh, violent Old Testament passages. So I begin with the problem of evil with them. Though Dawkins persists in calling God a moral monster, this charge makes no sense given his own worldview. He claims that in a universe of selfish genes and electrons, there is no good or evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. And rather than having any moral freedom or personal responsibility, we're simply dancing to the music of our DNA. Yet consider the new atheist moral critique of religion as evil. Of course, religion is itself a notoriously vague term, and the new atheists appropriate it with their, un- with their usual unsophisticated one-size-fits-all categorizations. Furthermore, the notion of evil assumes a kind of design plan that things ought to be different from what they are. But if so, whence the presumed standard by which to judge something as a deviation, corruption, or privation? 
and if all that exists is simply the result of valueless, non-conscious, unguided material processes, then things simply are. There is no ought. The atheist has a twofold problem to deal with, the problem of evil as well as the problem of the good. By contrast, intrinsically, the intrinsically good God of Christian theism offers a better metaphysical context to make sense of evil, indeed as the standard or the design plan himself. Considering this important metaphysical backdrop from the outset will better assist us as, as we put specific Old Testament moral questions and atheist criticisms into proper perspective. Secondly, we should frankly acknowledge that challenging and baffling portions of scripture indeed do exist, which is very much in keeping with the spirit of numerous Old Testament saints as they cry out to God. Recent book titles about Old Testament ethical reflections, books by Christian authors, reflect this honest acknowledgement. God behaving badly, the violence of scripture, the God I don't understand, disturbing divine behavior, divine evil, is God a moral monster? Did God really command genocide? This strange and sacred scripture. Raising such questions is neither immoral nor theologically inappropriate. The scriptures themselves remind us that God does not rebuff our honest questioning, and those scriptures exhort us to show mercy on those with such doubts. God patiently, graciously hears psalmists and prophets when they cry, How long, O Lord? And you, God, deceived me, and I was deceived. Thirdly, experiencing a certain moral dissonance with the Old Testament texts is understandable. First, God is the cosmic authority whose holy ways will often challenge our own. Secondly, we Westerners are far removed from an ancient Near Eastern mindset into which God speaks and to which he accommodates himself. Bruce Birch observes that this world of patriarchy and polygamy and taboos concerning blood, semen, and death is totally alien utterly unlike and in some cases repugnant to us moderns. Thus, we should press our critics to show patience and charitability, and as ethicist Oliver O'Donovan urges, something of a suspension of moral judgment to allow an ancient society constructed on different terms from any we note to express its own moral priorities. Fourth, God steps into a fallen, messy world and gets his hands dirty. Thus, various mosaic laws were given because of the hardness of human hearts. Imagine trying to bring democracy to a place like Saudi Arabia and consider what would be required to change a certain entrenched mindset there. This would have to be done incrementally, working from the situation on the ground toward the ideal. Likewise, God accommodates an ancient Near Eastern nation with its sinful and stultifying social structures, and yet he points them toward the ideal. John Golden Gay writes, God gets his hands dirty to a certain point that he works within a fallen world, though not the original product of his own pure hands. Thus, God may issue commands with a reluctant or grieved heart, yet always desiring repentance over wrath. Fifth, the Old Testament God is the God with whom Jesus and the New Testament writers unapologetically identify. A common notion is that the Old Testament God is wrathful, violent, severe, and even cruel, but thank heaven, the New Testament God and Father of Jesus is gracious and kind, and he commands us to love even our enemies. Indeed, some Christian scholars have reinforced this Marcionite tendency. I'm thinking of Eric Seibert, who differentiates between the textual God, a literary representation shaped by the Old Testament author's worldview, and the true or actual nonviolent God whom Jesus reveals and who isn't behind violence and temporal judgments. And Peter Enns, another Old Testament scholar, holds the same view. Such a dichotomy, however, is alien to the New Testament. Jesus and the apostles fully identify themselves with the judging, punishing, wrathful, but also gracious and merciful Old Testament God. And the Old Testament already talks about loving enemies and the humble inheriting the land. Jesus himself affirms Old Testament judgments, such as the Noahic flood, Sodom, the death penalty in Israel, punishing Gentile nations, and Jesus denounces stumbling blocks and false teachers and wicked cities of his day, calling for temporal judgments in the severest of terms. These are themes repeated by other New Testament writers and authorities as well. You see, both Testaments assume the kindness and severity of God. Indeed, the New Testament actually displays an intensification of both the love and wrath of God in light of Christ's coming. 
Now, after these uh, general points, we move to some specific ones and pertaining in particular to the Canaanite question, which I've been asked to address specifically. Sixth, the Canaanites engaged in all manner of behaviors that would be considered criminal acts in any civilized society today. These included infant sacrifice, ritual sex, bestiality, and incest, the kinds of acts in which their own pantheon of deities engaged. And the land God had graciously promised Israel could only be given once the Canaanites had become sufficiently wicked, but not before. Hardly morally superior, the Israelites would likewise be vomited out for the land, from the land for engaging in those same practices. Seven, the difficult command to drive out the Canaanites was accompanied by public, highly visible, powerful signs verifiable to all onlookers. Muhammad's or Joseph Smith's alleged revelations were private. Moses, Moses and Joshua's divine directives were reinforced by signs such as plagues in Egypt, the Red Sea parting, the pillar of cloud by day and fire by night, daily manna, wilderness miracles, and the parting of the Jordan. The Canaanites even recognized this and could have fled or repented. They did, after all, have 40 years to think about it. Eight, a good, wise God would not command what is intrinsically evil, which is metaphysically and morally impossible, a contradiction on par with square circles. However, God did on occasion issue difficult commands in certain unique and unrepeatable circumstances. And being a maximally great being, he would be pos best positioned to do so. Making the following important ethical distinctions here will offer greater clarity on the Canaanite question in my view. First, there are absolute duties like love God or don't worship false deities that allow for no exceptions whatsoever. Then there are general or prima facie duties like don't deceive or don't take innocent human life. All things being equal, these commands are generally morally binding, but there may be exceptions given particular conditions. Finally, there are extraordinary duties which come in cases of supreme emergency and may override general, though not absolute, duties. If a wise God issues exceptional commands in unique salvation historical circumstances, those exceptions don't undermine the general commands. This is no more so than a mother's command for a young child to hold her hand when crossing the street, having a lifelong application to that child. No, when the child is old, he can depart from it. Though deception is generally wrong, our yes should be yes and our no, no, it is morally, biblically permissible in cases of warfare or criminal activity. We ourselves engage in legitimate deception when we leave our house lights on when we're gone for the evening. As for the general prohibition not to take innocent human life, again, this is not absolute. In an ectopic pregnancy, taking this little life, though tragic, would be justified in that at least the mother's life should be saved. Or a prime minister is justified in giving orders to shoot a terrorist hijacked plane out of the sky to prevent massive loss of life, though innocence will on on board uh, will be killed. Now, these may be contentious, but it's not as though this is a crazy idea. Likewise, if it turns out that any Canaanites who were killed by God's command happen to be innocent, this would not be intrinsically evil. So rather than insisting that a good God couldn't command killing Canaanites because he is necessarily good, we should think of it this way. Because God is necessarily good and wise, God would have a morally justifiable reason for commanding this. Nine, God's primary command was to drive out or dispossess the Canaanites, phase one, if you will, and those remaining behind would leave themselves open to being killed, phase two, in defiance of public divine signs that the Canaanites had seen or been aware of for over 40 years. And then 10, ancient Near Eastern war texts, including the book of Joshua, use hyperbole such as utterly destroyed and they left no survivors much like our trash talking in sports about slaughtering or annihilating the other team. Those same peoples who are utterly destroyed often reappear chapters later. This is true of the Canaanites, the Midianites, and the Amalekites. Unlike an all-out complete divine destruction of humanity in the flood of Noah or the destruction of Sodom, we cannot say the same about war texts in the Old Testament. Judges 1 and 2 reinforces this point when it frequently mentions how the Israelites could not drive them out, or they are there to this day. We have a more gradual infiltration than a sudden decisive military blitzkrieg. As Egyptologist Kenneth Kitchen argues, the Israelite attacks were disabling raids on military citadels, 
after which Israel would head back to its base camp at Gilgal. So we see that there is uh, something of a muting here as we look more closely at these Canaanite texts. But let me offer a few words in conclusion. Yahweh, the worship-worthy cosmic authority, is good, though not safe, as we're reminded by C.S. Lewis's portrayal of the Jesus figure Aslan. Divine wrath, indeed the wrath of the Lamb, is reluctantly discharged when sinners repudiate God's gracious initiatives and disobey God's command for all people everywhere to repent. Perhaps, and especially for those who have no background in biblical study or no church background, it might be helpful to remind them to consider the experience of the Yale theologian Miroslav Volf, who comments on his own erstwhile rejection of a wrathful God, which he thought was too low or too undignified for the great God of the universe to have. He says, my last resistance to the idea of God's wrath was a casualty of the war in the former Yugoslavia, the region from which I come. My villages and cities were destroyed. My people shelled day in and day out. Some of them brutalized beyond imagination. And I could not imagine God not being angry. Wolf came to realize that he would have to rebel against a God who did not get angry at the world's evils. And he says, God isn't wrathful in spite of being love. God is wrathful because God is love. Thank you very much. The book of Job is synonymous with suffering. This book has been the favorite book of the Bible for thinkers as diverse as Maimonides and William Blake. It has become the book of everyone who suffers. H. Wheeler Robinson's work entitled Suffering Human and Divine made its appearance in 1939 as the fifth volume in the Great Issues of Life series. In the preface to his volume, Robinson wrote, a small book on so great and familiar a subject labors under a serious disadvantage. So many books have been written about suffering that anyone who refused to read another might well be excused. After all, what can be said that is new? What indeed can be said that's worth saying? Why not frankly admit that the perennial problem of suffering is insoluble? Let me start with a brief word on methodology. First, exegesis must always provide the blueprint for theology. It is exegesis that establishes the foundation, defines the parameters, and determines the contours for what we are able to say about God and what we should believe. If we do not get our ideas about God from the text of Scripture, they are not worth having. If we do not conscientiously configure our thinking about God to Scripture, then we run the risk of producing a caricature. A caricature can arise by saying something about God which Scripture does not say, or by saying more about God than what Scripture itself says. For doctrine to be true, it must first of all be truthful. No exaggeration, no overstatement, no over-description, no matter how well-intentioned. Just the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Secondly, human knowledge and understanding have limits. As Wayne Grudem has succinctly put it, we can never fully understand any single thing about God. Scripture does not provide answers to many of the questions we ask, especially those that have to do with suffering. What I can know and understand about divine action and human suffering has limits. But the book of Job, in its own unique way, provides a glimpse into a reality that is mysteriously tinged with suffering. So what I'm going to do is to put forward four theses regarding divine action and human suffering in the book of Job. I offer these as insights, not answers. Thesis one, the book of Job is not about suffering. Interpreters have long regarded the problem of suffering to be central to the book of Job. Job. 
The problem is, the book does not perceive suffering to be a problem. And suffering does not seem to be a problem for anyone in the book, except maybe Job. So the problem of suffering is not the question being addressed. The question the book answers is actually introduced in chapter 1, verse 9 by the Satan. Is it without cause that Job fears God? The pointed issue has to do with motivation. Whether it's possible for anyone to offer God devotion that is not contingent on getting something in return. Here's the question. Will human righteousness continue even after its expected rewards are discontinued? The book examines the possibility of unbought and unconditional righteousness. Suffering is the means by which the question will be explored, but suffering is not what the book is about. Thesis two. Suffering can be caused by God himself. Job's suffering is not random. It is well thought out. It is fully executed. It is judiciously evaluated. It is, after all, Yahweh who brings Job to the attention of the Satan because Job is an exemplar of unbought, unconditional righteousness. The biblical text gives every indication that the damage done in chapters 1 and 2, the violent dismantling of Job's life, was Yahweh's doing. What is clear in the wording of the Satan's proposal is this. Since it is Yahweh who has been protecting and blessing, it must be Yahweh who removes the protection and undoes the blessing. Second masculine singular imperatives and personal pronouns all referring to Yahweh dominate verse 11 of chapter 1. The Satan says, you stretch out your hand and you strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. The idea is unsettling, but there's no ambiguity in the words of the Satan. The proposal makes it clear that Yahweh himself must do the damage. In verse 12, Yahweh accepts the challenge with a simple predication. Yahweh said, behold, all that he has is in your hand. Now that phrase, that collocation, everything he has is in your hands, is found only here in the Hebrew Bible. For somebody or something to be in someone's hands mean that they are under that person's authority. Yahweh's words have traditionally been understood and interpreted as marking a shift of agent and responsibility. Everything he has is in your hands has been interpreted to mean, okay, I give you, the Satan, the power or permission for you to destroy everything he owns. Or, very well, you can take away all that he has. This interpretation effectively makes the Satan responsible for the actual destruction of all that Job has. An interpretation which might seem to protect Yahweh from the unseemliness of Job's devastation. At least that's one motivation for that interpretation. But this really doesn't help Yahweh. Even the position that Yahweh permits The Satan doesn't help him. David Kleins clarifies, delegated permission is delegated authority, and the ultimate delegator has the ultimate responsibility. But more importantly, this is not how the narrator is telling the story. The traditional, theologically finessed interpretation would actually require different syntax. To hand someone over to someone else for violence or for judgment or any other reason would require the verb to give, natan, in collocation with the prepositional phrase b plus the noun yad, hand, into someone's hand. That's not what we have here. 
Yahweh's predication means simply that Yahweh has accepted the specifics of the Satan's proposal. That is, everything that Job has will now be as the Satan specified in his proposal. The narrator, the most authoritative voice in the book, confirms this understanding in chapter 42, verse 11 when he says that all of his brothers and sisters and everyone who had known him came and they ate bread and they consoled him and they comforted him, the text says, on account of all the evil which Yahweh brought upon him. Any reader of the book of Job is confronted with a challenge. Do I accept the book's portrayal of God, and incorporate that portrayal into my theological thinking, or do I avoid or reject what the author reveals about God because it doesn't fit what I already believe about him? As I stated at the outset, I believe theology must be exegetically, unrelentingly solid. And when exegesis and theology collide, as they seem to do here, exegesis must be, must be allowed to, to point the way. Job himself has this understanding of the source of his affliction and loss. He affirms in verse 21, Yahweh gives and Yahweh takes. And again in chapter 2 verse 10, Job's understanding is that it is God who has done this to him. Moreover, he says, shall we accept good from God and not the bad? According to the text of Job, suffering can be the direct result of divine action. God does not just allow suffering. He can cause it in certain circumstances. Thesis three. Innocent suffering exists. Three times in the first two chapters, Job is described by both the narrator and God as no one else in Scripture, as blameless, upright, fearing God, and turning away from evil. God declares in chapter 1, verse 8, and 2, verse 3, there is no one like him on the earth. Job is an impeccably God-fearing man, and both God and the Satan agree on that. What they do not agree on is why he is that way. God is confident that unbought and unconditional righteousness exists among those who worship him. The Satan disagrees. Well, the way to determine if unbought and unconditional righteousness truly exists is to give someone the opportunity to demonstrate it. Take away absolutely everything that could possibly bribe allegiance, that could buy commitment, remove every possible evidence of divine favor, and see what happens. And so the suffering begins. When the Satan comes to present himself again, Yahweh makes an astonishing admission. He, Job, still maintains his integrity. You incited me against him to destroy him without cause. That word without cause, chinam, is an adverb that is found only four times in the book of Job, but its presence throughout both the prologue and the dialogue serve to reinforce its thematic function. Two interpretations surface in the translations and in the commentaries, neither of them without a theological edge. The emphasis in Yahweh's words in 2.3 is not on the futility of the test. That is, you incited me without cause, without benefit, to destroy him. The syntax places the focus on the unjustifiable destruction. You incited me to destroy him without cause. The tests have shown that Job's reverence for God is not contingent on what he has or what he has lost. Job's devotion without cause has brought Job's destruction without cause. The theological implications of the syntax here can be devastating for both exegete and theologian. Almost everyone flinches on this one. To destroy someone without cause is unjust by any definition. 
But the difficulty of the verse is eclipsed, I believe, by the significance of what we are being shown. This awkward turn of text makes it clear that the existence of unconditional righteousness is so important to God that God is willing to violate justice temporally and locally in order to prove it exists. So in this case, justice is locally and temporally suspended in order to test its relationship to righteousness. Um, okay. The book of Job affirms the traditional idea of divine justice. Job is wrong in saying that God does not punish the wicked, but he's right in saying that he himself is innocent. So innocent suffering does exist. The friends are wrong in saying that suffering is proof of wickedness. The friends are right in saying that God rules justly. You warn people that they will suffer for their sins, but you do not make the reverse deduction. You do not condemn sufferers as sinners because suffering may have other causes, reasons we cannot know. The notion of God interfering with justice is unsettling, I will admit. But we have to remember that when God interferes with justice, it's not always in the direction of pain and suffering. Grace and mercy means an infringement on the justice formula too. It means a person has not received the punishment due him or her according to the recompense formula. Justice isn't everything. It's not the only thing involved in God's management of the universe. My fourth thesis is simply this. Individual suffering such as Job's may be proof, not of wickedness, as the friends think, but of righteousness. The friends' assessment of Job was driven by their theology of this unwavering adherence to the retribution principle. The righteous will prosper, the wicked will suffer. Job is suffering, so they must conclude that Job is wicked, but he's not. His character is unassailable. His righteousness, unprecedented, unrivaled. His devotion to God, unbought and unconditional. And that's why he is suffering. But this is a fact that Job never learns. God tells Job far less than the author tells us because in real life, we are not readers, we are Job's. Job's ignorance of the specific factors operating his own situation is equivalent to our ignorance of specific factors in our own. Conclusion. I've suggested that the book of Job is not about suffering. I've suggested that suffering can be caused by righteousness. Job couldn't make sense of his suffering, and he never received an explanation. The friend's vigorous defense of the character of God almost cost them their lives because they didn't speak of him what was right. From the depths of his suffering, Job, using the language of lament, challenged God, and that makes us uncomfortable. But Job kept talking to God. He never stopped talking to God because Job knew God and because Job knew that God knew him. We have incredible wisdom. We have wisdom great enough to observe God working in the far reaches of time and space, but part of that wisdom entails awareness of our own weakness and ignorance. We as humans are frail and insignificant, but we have an opportunity to give God something that God desires more than anything, and that is unbought, unconditional righteousness. Devotion that is not contingent on what we have or what we have lost. Commitment without any contingencies. But the whole point of that gift is that the giver can never know the circumstances that have called forth the giving. The feeling that one's suffering may somehow be needed for the fulfillment of God's plans is what enables people to choose martyrdom. But martyrs know, or at least they think they know, 
why they are suffering. The book of Job suggests that one's ordinary suffering, great or small, can serve the purposes of God, especially when one does not and may never know the reason why or how this happens. And a gift of that sort requires far greater faith than martyrdom. Retrieving a tradition that has been around since Marcion and the Manichees, Richard Dawkins has called the God of the Old Testament, the living God, a cruel ogre. Dawkins begins with a story of Noah and the flood, which he summarizes as follows. Quote, God took a dim view of humans, so, so he, with the exception of one family, drowned a lot of them, including children, and also, for good measure, the rest of the presumably blameless animals as well. End quote. After killing off nearly the entire human race and most animals, God next focuses attention on Sodom and Gomorrah, where he destroys the whole city with the exception of Lot and his family. God encourages Moses to undertake the slaughter in the camp of the Israelites who had manufactured the golden calf, and so on. After continuing at length in, some of the, in this vein, Dawkins concludes that God is, quote, an evil monster. And that's, um, that provided the... The, um, the title for Dr. Copen's book, um, you know, has got a moral monster. So, does God love human bloodletting and the mass slaughter of human groups? Does God love this? Arguably, the first question we should ask in this regard is whether this question is raised and answered in the Bible itself. In fact, it is. The Lord raises this very question through the prophet Ezekiel. He asks, quote, have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Ezekiel 18, 23. If this rhetorical question does not make matters clear, the Lord goes on to state bluntly, quote, I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Ezekiel 18, 32. Later in Ezekiel, lest his meaning be missed, the Lord reiterates that, quote, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Ezekiel 33, 11. The wisdom of Solomon, which influenced the New Testament writings in significant ways, adds that, quote, God did not make death, and he does not delight in the death of the living. Wisdom 113. In fact, in the book of Genesis, we see that God does not create human death, but rather human death comes about because of rebellion on the part of the first humans. In the book of Isaiah, death appears as God's enemy to be conquered in the eschatological consummation of all things. Far from loving human death, God, quote, will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, Isaiah 25, 8. Similarly, in the book of Revelation, with which the Bible concludes, God gives death, pictured as a rider on a pale horse, quote, power over a fourth of the earth. But in the end, death is shown to be powerless and to be the enemy of God. The seer states, quote, and I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, by what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead in them, and all were judged by what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown in the lake of fire. Revelation 20, 12, 14. From the lake of fire, we are told, death will never again reemerge. So if we accept that God will conquer death, and that God, quote, has no pleasure in the death of anyone, including the wicked, we can know that God does not love or wish the death of anyone. Yet, God in the Old Testament commands the death of many people, including infants and toddlers, and God certainly allows the suffering and death of all people. Uh, so, um, furthermore, many prophetic books depict God slaughtering thousands of evildoers when God finally arises to defend his people. For example, God promises that, quote, I will stir up the spirit of a destroyer against Babylon, and the result will be that, quote, they shall fall down slain in the land of the Chaldeans and wounded in her streets. Jeremiah 51. Similarly, the prophet Isaiah depicts God finally wreaking his vengeance by means of slaughter. Quote, I tried them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their light blood is sprinkled on my garments, and I have stained all my raiment. I tried down the people in my anger. I made them drunk in my wrath, and they poured out their lifeblood on the earth. Isaiah 63. 
Earlier in Isaiah's prophecy, God wreaks vengeance upon his innocent servant. Quote, it was the will of the Lord to bruise him because, quote, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God's servant, quote, poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Uh, 53. What kind of picture of God is this? Even if we must take God at his word, that he has no pleasure in the death of anyone, and in my view, we should certainly take God at his word, because here scripture goes out of its way to answer clearly and precisely our question about whether God loves human death. It seems quite difficult to reconcile this point with God's actions, which include drowning all humans except for Noah and his family, frequently commanding the mass slaughter of large groups, going out of his way to ensure that infants are killed by, by, by Israelite soldiers, allowing his beloved people to be slaughtered like sheep, planning to kill many people on the eschatological day of vengeance, and even choosing a deadly path for his innocent servant. This God seems heavily invested in causing and permitting the deaths of both the innocent and the guilty. And in general, this God seems to conceive of the governance of the world as requiring a lot, uh, quite a tremendous amount of human death. If he does not take pleasure in the death of anyone, why is he so thoroughly engaged in dealing out death? Two reasons are sometimes given, neither of which fully works in my view. First, God's words to Job can be cited. Quote, will you ever put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like God, and can you thunder with a voice like his? End quote. Uh, Job 40, 8 to 9. Or as God, Job asked earlier, the same idea here. Quote, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. In, quote. in both instances, the case can be made that God's um, dangerous power simply bursts forth wherever he wills in an arbitrary fashion. We can neither understand it, nor stop it, nor attempt to justify it. When we think that his power is confinable to our laws, this is uh, um, a certain view, he bursts the bonds that we would make for him. Along these lines, we read that, quote, fire came forth from the Lord and consumed the 250 men offering the incense. And the people of Israel said to Moses, Behold, we perish, we are undone, we are all undone. Everyone who comes near, who comes near to the tabernacle of the Lord shall die. Are we all to perish? Numbers 16 and 35. On this view, God may command us, quote, You shall not kill, uh, Exodus 20, 13, meaning murder, but God himself cannot be constrained on this view in his, in his untamed power by laws meant for humans. At best, we can remind God, quote, Thou art our Father, we are the clay, and Thou art our potter. We are all the work of Thy hand. Be not exceedingly angry, O Lord, and remember not iniquity forever. Isaiah 64, 8-9. So in my view, the position that God's power is unconstrained by any laws, such as you shall not kill, does not work for a number of reasons, including the fact that God is perfectly loving goodness and is perfectly righteous. Ultimately, this position fails also because God tells us clearly that far from desiring to spread death in an arbitrary fashion, he has no pleasure in the death of anyone. A second way of explaining the problem is to argue that God wills the death of the wicked, and since we are all wicked, God can justly require of King Saul, for example, that Saul, quote, go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have. Do not spare them, but kill both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. This answer, in my view, also fails, although it is certainly true that God can and does justly require all of our deaths. The answer that God justly wills the death of the wicked, true in a certain sense, fails to deal sufficiently, I think, with how the Old Testament portrays God's killing and commanding the killing of large groups. In my view, we cannot simply conclude that God has an affinity for the slaughter of large groups, even if it is just. Even if it is just for God to take the life of infants, we should ask whether it is just for God in loving his people Israel to command particular infant Israelite soldiers to kill pregnant women and children. Even if it were just, the very act of slaughtering small children and infants in the womb has existential and spiritual consequences for those who engage in such action. Moreover, Israel's God elsewhere distinguishes himself sharply from God's who require 
their followers to slaughter infants. And I think of Genesis 7, 22 and Leviticus 18, 21, Jeremiah 32, 35, and I know the context is different. Even if one is slaughtering other people's infants rather than one's own infants, it still seems to be an action that differs sharply from what we generally know of Israel's God. We know that God has, quote, no pleasure in the death of anyone, and certainly not in the death of someone's infant or toddler at the hands of Israelite soldier. How, then, can we think about God's relation to human death? I suggest answering this question by means of three principles. The first principle should be the clear affirmation that God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone, even the wicked. The second principle, then, affirms the justice of human death as a punishment of, of sin. Scripture makes clear that human death came into the world through an act of rebellion on the part of our first parents, and human nature in its fallen condition is mortal. Quote, of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you should not eat, for the day you eat of it you shall die. The first humans were created in a grace condition in which God preserved their bodily integrity as befit their spiritual integrity. Having turned away from God, humans tend toward death, um, since our bodies are corruptible flesh. Quote, you are dust, and to dust you shall return, Genesis 3. In our fallen and mortal condition, we experience death as a punishment because it is a just punishment arising from our alienated condition. See Romans 6.23. Again, when human nature is not specially upheld by God, human nature is intrinsically mortal because flesh and bone will, will corrupt and turn to dust in a relatively short span of time. Given these first two principles, the third principle involves the fact that we cannot simply assume that we know the divinely intended meaning of human words about God, even, those, even when the words are in Scripture. Rather, we must read all scriptural portraits of God in light of all that Scripture teaches about God. Most scholars can agree that not all scriptural words about God can be easily understood. For example, if we assume that we easily know what scripture is talking about when it describes God as, quote, walking in the garden and as making a sound, Genesis 3.8, then I think we are making a mistake. The text applies to God a bodily movement and a bodily sound that do not correspond to what other passages of scripture teach us about God, and nor do I think we need to assume or to think that Genesis 3 intends to, to teach us that about God. Likewise, when we read about God commanding the Israelites to slaughter the Amalekites' infants and sucklings, we need to pause before we deem ourselves certain about God's will, God's, God's specific will, uh, certain about our understanding of God's will in, in that passage. Since scriptural words can describe God in a way that's culturally conditioned, and since God expects us to be aware of this and to take precautions accordingly, notwithstanding the fact that we, we know that God's word is true, and we, we know that there is a truth there that um, we are intended to learn. We should survey the entirety of Scripture's passages about God before arriving at the certainty that God, like ancient Near Eastern kings, wills that Israelite men seek to spear pregnant women and cut the throats of women and their mother's breasts. We should not rule out a priori that there may be a divinely intended meaning discernible in such texts, that fits those texts better, and that fits scripture as a whole better in this regard, teaching about God. In God's providential plan, he does indeed exact the punishment of death. God is sovereign over life and death. Certainly, we, de we deserve death. I know, I know that. But his power is neither arbitrary nor expressive of even a just bloodthirstiness. To show this would require a fuller exposition of scriptural texts about God than I can offer here. But it is significant that in God's promised day of vengeance, he himself freely bears our curse for us, rather than slaughtering anyone. When God's Son comes among us, he tells his servants to put down their swords, and he chooses to die for sinners out of love. Rather than allowing Abraham to slaughter his child, God, quote, provides himself the lamb. Thank you very much. Good evening. 
Um, as a souvenir de visite, there should be a handout, actually, dealing with the lecture on the three patristic views of divine anger management in the Old Testament. So what you will find is the outline of today's presentation uh, on the front page, and then also in the reverse, there are some select quotations. Among different anthropomorphic descriptions of God in the Old Testament, the verses about divine wrath are some of the most problematic. Many readers, when they encounter passages that speak of, and I quote, the anger of the Lord burning against the people of Israel, uh, as in Joshua 7, 1, and of the day of wrath, as in many other passages of the Old Testament, these readers fall into a sharp Marcionite dichotomy that was invoked already today between uh, the Old Testament God of wrath and justice and the New Testament God of love and mercy. Even very sophisticated readers, like Adolf von Harnack, could be so persuaded by Marcion's line of reasoning that they could question the canonical status of the Old Testament. And von Harnack ended uh, effectively by denying uh, uh, the status of scripture to the Old Testament. Today I will focus on the problem of interpreting the passages that describe anger to God. I will address the problem as an orthodox theologian steeped in patristic thought and as a historian of late antiquity. Uh, as a quick aside, I, I applaud your university's recent attempt to consider uh, a hiring uh, a patristics scholar, because it seems to me that's a wonderful step towards engaging the church fathers and making them and their thought uh, contemporaries. I will begin by considering the problem that philosophically sophisticated readers of scripture saw in ascribing anger to God. I will then consider three different ways in which the church fathers address this problem. And in a brief conclusion, I will suggest which of these three ways gives the best account of the biblical witness. In Greek polytheism, the belief that the gods could be provoked to anger was a commonplace. The Epicureans were among the first Greek thinkers to challenge this belief. Under the influence of the Epicurean and Stoic critique, most Hellenistic philosophers came to regard the attribution of anger to divine nature as a popular superstition. So Cicero reports that, and I quote, it is the unanimous teaching of all philosophers that God is never angry, nor does he injure anyone, end of quotation. So pagan readers of the Old Testament could justifiably ask, wasn't the God of the prophets afflicted with the same kinds of passions as the gods of the Greek poets? And so, for example, Emperor Julian argued that the deity portrayed in scripture fared no better before the moral critique of the philosophers than the passionate gods of Homer. Now, in the context of polemic with pagan religions, some early Christian theologians relied without much reflection upon a highly influential Stoic view that anger was an irrational perturbation unworthy of a true philosopher. And so criticizing pagan myths, Athenagoras and Aristides conceded the Stoic view that the passion of anger was intrinsically evil, on par with the passions of greed and lust. On these grounds, these church fathers concluded that anger without qualification was unworthy of God. In the same context, a North African theologian of the third century, Arnobius, refused to give the divine anger any positive function in his theology. According to Arnobius, to be angry is nothing else than, and I quote, to be insane, to rave, to be carried away by the lust of revenge, and made savage by the loss of reason, to revel in the tortures of another's grief. End of quotation. Following the Stoics, Arnobius saw anger as an essentially demoralizing and harmful emotion, potentially leading to self-destruction. In his apologetic work against Greek polytheism, Arnobius wrote, and this is a quote number one on your handout, Overleaf. You judge that the deities are angry, that is you, the pagans, judge that the deities are angry and perturbed and given over and subject to the other mental affections. We think that such emotions are alien from them, for these suit savage beings and those who die as mortals. End of quotation. 
Now, given this understanding of anger, Arnobius' conclusion that, and I quote, the gods are not angry at any time, is not surprising. If anger in all cases blinds one's judgment, then indeed anger is an emotion unworthy of God. Now, however, the majority of the fathers would find this particular popular philosophical treatment of anger one-sided. They recognized that anger was a morally ambiguous rather than plainly evil emotion. Some expressions of anger may indeed be conscious blinding, uncontrollable, and evil. However, other instances of anger convey a morally valuable reaction, namely condemnation of sin. The anonymous author of the Pseudo-Clementine Recognitions, written most probably in Syria in the beginning of the third century, aptly summarizes the double-sided nature of anger. And this is quotation number two on your handout. The philosophers say that God is not angry, not knowing what they say. For anger is evil whenever it disturbs the mind, so it destroys right judgment. That anger, however, which punishes the wicked, does not bring on disturbance of the mind, but is, I may say, one and the same affection which allots rewards to the good and punishment to the wicked. For if he should give blessings to the virtuous and to the wicked and bestow similar remuneration on the good and the evil, he would appear unjust rather than good, he being God. The author, this is the end of quotation, the author argues that the unqualified denial of divine anger leaves one with limited means for expressing divine judgment. Now, it is Lactantius in his work on the wrath of God that in him we find a mature patristic answer to the philosophical unease with ascribing anger to God. So the Stoics were convinced that anger could never be rationally directed and contribute nothing to the extermination of evil. For them, anger only confounded moral judgment instead of increasing its force. And so hence, anger must be eradicated, on the Stoic view, from the soul as completely as possible, not merely controlled by reason. Lactantius disagreed with the Stoic refusal to admit any moral fruit, morally fruitful application of anger. Some instances of anger, Lactantius argued, have a morally sound teleology, and that is they're directed at punishing the wicked. Distinguishing between just and unjust anger, he suggested that only the former could be ascribed to God. Just, Justin, Theophilus, Cyprian, Commodian, and others shared the conviction that anger was a powerful tool for expressing condemnation of sin. Now, if God can be said to be angry in a qualified sense, how precisely does, he, does God experience anger? Does God really feel anger? Now, there was a diversity of opinion on this particular matter. Some uh, patristic theologians like the Alexandrians, Clement, and Origen responded that although God himself did not feel anger, humans experienced the consequences of his judgment and punishment as if God were indeed angry. So they explained that biblical authors ascribed anger, vengeance, and fury to God in order to instill pious fear in simple believers. The use of such language, according to Clement and Origen, is primarily pedagogical and metaphorical. John Cassian insisted that anger should be ascribed to God, not anthropopathos, that is to say, anthropopathically as a human emotion, but, and I quote, in a sense worthy of God, who is a stranger to all perturbations. End of quotation. Following the Alexandrian tradition, John Cassian held that God in his very being did not experience anger. It was the fear of divine punishment, Cassian proposed, that caused humans to experience divine kindness and justice as wrath and vehement anger. Augustine put the matter in similar terms. For him, divine anger is a function of human reaction. And this is quote number three. The wrath of God is an emotion which is produced in the soul which knows the law of God when it sees this same law transgressed by sinners. So according to Augustine, to speak of God as becoming angry is a common but not an entirely sound way of expressing the idea of divine punishment. And this is quote number four. God doesn't suffer perturbation when he visits men in anger, but either by an abuse of the word or by a peculiarity of idiom Anger is used in the sense of punishment, end of quotation. According to Augustine, and who was by no means, as we will see, consistent on this point, 
What humans perceive as divine anger is not an inherent quality of divine life, but a human reaction to divine punishment and divine judgment. To imagine God as angry is a human way of realizing the gravity of sin and inevitability of divine judgment. Such an understanding of divine anger may be called subjectivist on the grounds that to be angry doesn't belong to the nature of God, but only to the way in which humans perceive divine judgment. In contrast, and this is the third view, in contrast, Tertullian, Lactantius, and Novatian would disagree with the purely subjectivist interpretation of divine anger. In their view, God indeed experiences anger, although in a carefully qualified sense. Lactantius explains that divine anger is perpetual in the sense that God does not change his disposition towards unrepentant sinners. Those who do not reform will reap, says Lactantius, uh, the consequences of God's everlasting wrath. At the same time, God is kind, long-suffering, and compassionate to those who repent. God is fully in control of his anger, and he never becomes angry arbitrarily. The ancients believed that uncontrollable passions both disrupted one's emotional life and corrupted one's physical existence. Unlike humans, God is neither emotionally overwhelmed nor physically destroyed by the passion of anger. Novation aptly expressed this idea, and this is quote number five. A human being can be corrupted by passions since he is corruptible, but God cannot be corrupted by passions since he is incorruptible. The passions may overpower material which is passable, not impassable substance. God becomes angry not out of vice, but for the sake of healing us. He is merciful even when he threatens, because through his menaces, humans are recalled to rectitude. End of quotation. God's anger is rationally directed then towards the healing of human vice. Considering the issue of divine patience, Augustine developed the distinction between divine and human emotions along similar lines. And this is the final quotation. Says Augustine, his patience is indescribable, yet it exists as does his jealousy, his wrath, and any characteristic of this kind. But if we conceive of these qualities as they exist in us, God has none of them. We do not experience these feelings without annoyance, but far be it from us to suspect an impassable God of suffering any annoyance. Just as God is jealous without any ill will, as he is angry without being emotionally upset, as he pities without grieving, as he is sorry without connecting any fault, correcting any fault, so he is patient without suffering at all. End of quotation. So here, in contrast to the passages cited before, Augustine doesn't deny that God can, in fact, experience anger. So, and Augustine expresses a common conviction of the fathers that divine impassibility, immunity to uh, influences from without, does not rule out all divine emotions. So instead, divine impassibility entails freedom and control over those emotional states that humans cannot manage easily. God is impassable in the sense of being immune to the negative consequences typically associated with human emotions. Augustine emphasizes that God is not overpowered by anger or by any other perturbation contrary to reason. To conclude, a minority of early Christian writers, including Athenagoras, Aristides, and Arnobius, deny that anger can be ascribed to God in any sense of the word. Clement, Origen, and John Cassian propose that divine anger expresses the effect of divine punishment upon sinners, offering what I called a subjectivist interpretation. Tertullian, Lactantius, Novatian, and less consistently Augustine take a third view, according to which God experiences anger in the manner that is appropriate to God alone. They assert that God fully controls his anger, that he never exercises anger arbitrarily, but always as a moral indignation at human sin. So in my view, the third position has the attraction of respecting the expressive power of biblical language and of finding a constructive moral function for divine anger. God, we might say, is the only person capable of a perfect 
anger management. Thank you very much. Okay, um, we are now moving on to round two where they're going to have. If you haven't yet had a chance to give your questions over to the attendants, please do that. Uh, Dr. Paul Cohe. I don't really have any noteworthy disagreements with my fellow panelists. Uh, while their responses to my presentation may turn out to be more debate-like, we'll wait and see, uh, I view their presentations as uh, fairly harmonious with my own thinking about the morally challenging Old Testament texts and themes that they mention. Uh, first, I'll respond to Dennis McGarry, uh, my Hebrew grammar and exegesis professor when I was here at TEDS. He has given an insightful, honest, and clear assessment of the theology of Job. As he says, Job isn't about suffering. Uh, Job, someti God sometimes causes suffering. Uh, the innocent suffer, and suffering may at times be proof of righteousness. Uh, let me now make two clarifying comments, uh, one minor, uh, one major, and I don't think Dennis would disagree with either. But my minor comment is in response to the following assertion. If we do not get our ideas about God from the text of Scripture, they are not worth having. Now, I think this is too quick. Uh, insofar as we are speaking of special revelation, I'm in full agreement. Uh, but when it comes to general revelation, as Romans 1 reminds us, God's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made so that people are without excuse. And we see this point borne out in texts such as Psalm 19, Psalm 104, uh, and speeches made by Paul in Acts 14 at Lystra and Acts 17 at Athens. Uh, something of God's nature is indeed evident in creation and conscience, uh, aside from or apart from Scripture. A major comment. Uh, while innocent Job has been afflicted without cause, this is not to say that it was without purpose. Again, I think Dennis would uh, be in general agreement. Uh, theistic philosophers of religion have distinguished between inscrutable evil and gratuitous evil, uh, simply because God's reasons for various uh, evils uh, uh, being permitted, uh, because those are unknown or unknowable to us, this does not permit us to conclude that these evils are therefore utterly pointless. Uh, this is what is uh, non sequitur, uh, what some have called a no see em inference. Uh, if I can't see them, that is the reasons for permitting this, they must not be there. We're simply not well positioned to assume that if there seems to be no rhyme or reason why certain evils occur, such as Jesus uh, commenting on the, uh, the Galileans that were slain in the temple or the Tower of Siloam that fell and killed uh, some Israelites, uh, you know, where these uh, were these worse sinners than the rest? Jesus said, I tell you, no, but unless you repent, you will likewise perish. Uh, um, so even though there seems to be no rhyme or reason, this uh, does not indicate that the evils are in actual fact pointless. But let us say that God has permitted bona fide pointless evils, perhaps one might argue in the case of Job. This still does not negate the fact that such evils cannot have broader purposes involved with them. For example, C.S. Lewis notes, pain is God's megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Or, as philosopher Peter Van Inwagen observes, such evils can shake us out of any complacent illusion that all is well in this fallen world when in fact we are profoundly alienated from God. Moreover, many theistic philosophers of religion acknowledge that even if gratuitous evils do exist, this would by no means undermine the doctrine of God's goodness or even his existence, since evil itself presupposes a kind of design plan which points us in the direction of God. So again, just a few uh, points there of clarification. In response to uh, Matthew Levering, uh, I... Uh, I concur with his uh, three principles in general, although perhaps we can discuss the three distinctions that I made about the absolute duties, the general duties, and the overriding duties in unique conditions or supreme emergencies. But, but I want to focus on the third point here. 
where he says, we cannot simply assume that we know what the divinely intended meaning of human words about God are, even when those words are in Scripture. True, we must read them in view of all that Scripture teaches about God, noting that most scholars agree that not all scriptural words about God can be easily understood. So this would mean uh, that we should take care before announcing, say, that God commanded genocide. Uh, we should ask questions such as, what is the biblical genre under consideration? Uh, are there stock expressions and hyperbolized accounts found in ancient Near Eastern war texts that could shed light on the biblical text? Are there any tensions within these alleged slaughter texts of the Old Testament such that, if taken literally, they would lead to gross contradictions? How do other parts of scripture view such texts? Do they regard Joshua's dispossessing the Canaanites as merely a moral or spiritual lesson, such as uh, we need to drive out the Canaanite-like sinful passions of our hearts so that we can enter the promised land of God's blessing? The New Testament suggests at least some affirmation of actual military warfare and dispossession. Stephen in Acts 7.45 speaks of Joshua dispossessing the nations whom God drove out. Paul in Acts 13, 19 says that God destroyed seven nations in the land of Canaan. And the author of Hebrews mentions those who by faith conquered kingdoms. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, of course, offers some insights here as well. When Paul says that these uh, are negative examples uh, for, uh, you know, for our benefit. Uh, working out many of these tensions acknowledged by the breadth of biblical scholarship should prompt us first to cultivate humility. Secondly, to continue searching with all the available theological and philosophical tools at our disposal. And third, at times to content ourselves with the realization that certain tidy or final solutions may elude us. As we work them out, we must hold unwaveringly to the reality that God is not the author of evil and could never command that which is intrinsically evil. But again, there are indeed tensions that need to be worked out things that are still being discussed, and, uh, and, and indeed we've had some very good discussion tonight. Paul Gavriluk, fellow Ukrainian, uh, he, uh, just a, again a brief uh, comment, nothing uh, of, uh, of, of uh, substance to criticize here. Uh, as to divine anger, he rightly rejects the extremes of an arbitrary, unprincipled anger of pagan polytheism and the stoic denial that anger is somehow unworthy of God, and rather a kind of principled anger as an appropriate expression of divine justice and a requirement for divine judgment is in order. But unlike humans, uh, God is not overwhelmed or corrupted by anger as humans often are. And I myself find the uh, proposal of Augustine et al. Uh, satisfying that God experiences anger in the manner that is appropriate to God alone and that God fully controls his anger, and that he never exercises anger arbitrarily, but always as moral indignation at human sin. And I, I think that is a, a fair uh, and, and adequate representation, so I'll say no more there. Uh, these, then, are my summary comments, and let me say that it's been a privilege for me to be part of this fine panel of fellow scholars and brothers in Christ as we discuss these challenging biblical texts and topics. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul, for admitting that I was your Hebrew teacher. <laughs> and thank you especially for taking us tonight where angels and many of the rest of us fear to tread. You have modeled an approach that should be an encouragement to all. I commend you for your strong emphasis on the careful reading of scripture. I appreciated the ethical distinctions that you offer. Uh, the distinction between absolute duties allow for exceptions and the general duties that are generally morally binding but which allow for exceptions. Extraordinary duties which come in cases of emergency and can override general but not absolute duties. What is not clear to me, though, are the criteria for distinction. How does one recognize an absolute duty. What makes a general prohibition general? Under what conditions would the generally morally binding general duties allow for an exception? 
Are there any criteria that govern or define an exception or supreme emergency? Or will that be ultimately in the eye of the beholder? And how are the distinctions safeguarded from relativizing? Matthew, thank you so much for your straightforward and insightful handling of a very complicated issue uh, in the Old Testament. I commend you for dealing with first things first, allowing scripture to speak for itself, allowing God to speak for himself regarding the view of human death. Your citations from Ezekiel 18 and 33 are significant. The reminder that death came as a result of sin is essential to any consideration of death's intrusion into life. Your conviction that we should certainly take God at his word because of the lengths to which scripture goes to answer clearly and precisely our question as to about, about whether God loves human death is an encouraging affirmation. I find myself able to track with you and your proposed principles for answering the question, how does God relate to human death? Well, at least two of the three. The first one, the clear affirmation that God takes no pleasure in the death of anyone, is the most compelling as I see it. He still kills people, but we know that he is not willing that any should perish. Your second principle, affirming the justice of human death as a punishment for sin, is canonically consistent. Your third principle is where I struggle. Your position is that we cannot simply assume that we know the divinely intended meaning of human words about God, even when those words are in Scripture. Rather, we must read all Scripture portraits of God in light of all that Scripture teaches about God. I do agree fully, not all scriptural words about God can be easily understood. I do embrace the idea that scripture must be allowed to interpret scripture. But methodologically, what serves as the control for what you are suggesting? How do I know when the divinely intended meaning of human words about God is different than the meaning of the human words about God I have there on the page. The reading strategy that you propose when I have seen it practiced usually results in neutralizing or silencing or even dismissing rather than explaining the plain sense of the text. God chose human language, Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic to communicate his will and the record of his work to us. Even though God used human agents to write these words down, I would maintain that he protected them as they wrote. He was able to do that because he made them. And he protected them as they wrote to make sure that what they were writing was accurately communicating the message with his intent. That's the genius of him using human language to convey the divine will. Paul, thank you for the thorough and enlightening consideration of divine anger in the church fathers. Your development and summary of the three views of the early Christian writers is not only historically insightful, but the approaches taken and the rationale for doing so by the church fathers is not unlike approaches and rationale followed throughout church history. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Denial that anger can be ascribed to God in any sense simply dismisses the problem. Proposing that divine anger expresses the effect of divine punishment upon sinners, which you designate as a subjectivist interpretation, simply redefines and shifts the focus. And proposing that God experiences anger in the manner that is appropriate to God alone, which I would agree is the most satisfying of the three alternatives, is at least linguistically, linguistically grounded and theological 
theologically tenable. You began with Marcion. Uh, it's apparent this evening Marcion is still alive. For almost 1900 years, Marcion has continued to affect the church and its view of scripture and its view of God and how we think theologically. The Old Testament God of wrath and justice and the New Testament God of love and mercy. One wonders if that heresy will ever finally be put to rest. I want to I want to thank um, um, my fellow members of the panel, um, just in general, for um, their graciousness and and um, and then also you for for coming tonight, and and then also the the organizers, of course, um, Tom and Chris and, and and Jeffrey, of course. So um, in in response to um, to Paul, um, Dr. Copen, um, I I think that he's he's right to emphasize um, that God. You know, was was justified in in his um, taking action against the the Canaanites and and, and dispossessing them. And I and in Scripture, of course, that is um, explained in terms of the the sins of the Canaanites. And so, um, so in my view, then it really is a, a matter of of turning to the to the more difficult um, passages, the the passages where um, where. It's, where I indicated in, in my own paper that, that I felt that, that um, were more, more concerning. And, and so that would be, um, essentially that would be the question that I would address to Paul, you know, would be um, um, essentially those, but of course he's already answered in his book, I, I know that, you know. <laughs> and, and I think he, he had an unfair advantage, you know, to have, to have already written so much on this topic. Um, but so that's, that's the question I have is the exceptional cases. I mean, the cases that are, are very difficult to read about and to, that, that I've mentioned. And, and, then also, and then to Dennis. And so his, his paper, of course, was a beautiful example of, of exegesis. And there is, and it is true that when theologians do exegesis, um, much, much goes missing. Of course, of course that's the case. But, but nonetheless, um, it could be also that, that theologians have, have insights, as I think he would certainly agree. So, so, and then it's also, um, you know, so I'm not, I'm not ruling out theologians I'm wading in not, nonetheless. Other, otherwise, I couldn't be here, and I couldn't have gone out to, to eat and all that other fun stuff. <laughs> so I guess I, I suppose, um, you know, the question that, that Dennis's paper raised, um, you know, most, most strongly, because, because he himself d discussed it in, in a careful way, was, was whether God violates justice in his test of Job. And so I, I'm sure that he would understand that, th that I would raise the, the question of um, questions like, I, I want to, to reflect again upon um, the genre of the book of Job and, and so forth. I, I understand that... Um, that in some in some respects that's a theologian taking the um, easy way out and, and all that stuff, but but nonetheless I do I do think the genre of the book of Job is, is so difficult to pin down. It it really is for me, you know, in terms of um of what where where we are to come down on 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 matters as in terms of how how to understand you know what is being expressed literally, what is being expressed. You know, in a different but equally um, rich way, um, and so forth. I, w I would think um, also about the Book of Job that the role of the Satan. One one thing that I always wonder about is why didn't God just do the job himself? You know, why? But I think that question is is raised certainly um, also even more if if God violates justice, because in that case he would hardly need the Satan. He could just go. Um, you could tell the Satan to step back and, and he'll handle it himself in a certain way. I mean, that was the thought that crossed my mind. Um, and so, um, but again, I, I, still, I still felt that there was a, I mean, there might be a disagreement here or there, but it was an extremely rich paper, so I, I valued it tremendously. And then in, um, 
for um, Dr. Gabriel Paul. Um, well, well, Paul, I'd, I'd love to have Paul did it because he had Augustine for um, one and then Augustine for another also. So the, the last two um, possibilities were, were both Augustine. So if I, wanna, if, I, if I tell Paul that I want to come down in favor of Augustine, then um, Paul, then he, he's not going to know which one I'm choosing, you know. <laughs> but, but I do, I, you know, myself, I really kind of would want to come down in favor of Augustine, but, but it really wouldn't be possible to explain all the reasons why, but uh, Paul can probably understand that I, I, I still think there's something to be said for Augustine in, in Paul's number three on the outline. I, I mentioned um, this your outline since you have the outline. Um, I, I think there's, there's still more to be said for that um, as we work out what, what anger is, especially is anger an emotion? Um, does anger require a body? If it's an emotion, does it require a body? I mean, Paul knows all these questions. Um, if, if we repent, is there a change in God from angry to happy? Um, and, and so forth. Um, now, again, Paul's written a book on this in terms of divine impassibility, and so he knows all the all the questions and answers um, that I could offer. So again, um, deep appreciation for, for what Paul um, gave, gave to us. Thank you so much. Well, I know that we're all more than willing to spring to action. So in the interests of time, I will be very, very brief. And of course, Matthew, as an Orthodox theologian, I realize that Augustine is full of wonderful and illuminating mistakes. And it's the, and it's the inconsistencies that I was interested, actually, in, in getting at. Very good. We're getting sort of warmed up. Because I was, for a moment, I actually thought I was in Minnesota. You know, we're not just God's frozen people. We're also the nicest people. Sounds like, you know, sort of, thou shalt not, thou shalt spare the Orthodox theologian was basically a, a commandment. Uh, uh, here now, it's clear that the elephant in the room is Marcion. I think this was this was pointed out uh, already. And a smaller invisible beast is Richard Dawkins. Now, since Marcion was a far more serious and rigorous reader of the Old Testament than Richard Dawkins, then I mean, Richard Dawkins really pales in comparison because, by comparison, Richard Dawkins's arguments are those uh, of a spoiled teenager. Uh, in many ways, but 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 to get a sense of just how serious the is you realize that if Marcion had his way, then effectively the Christian canon of Scripture would have consisted of the Gospel of Luke and ten Pauline epistles in Marcion's redaction. Now, the happy point about this would have been, of course, uh, that the students of this institution would not have had to learn Hebrew. <laughs> now, the unhappy point would be also that you would be unemployed. Uh, and so that, that so, 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 so there would be a much shorter canon. Uh, and so you can see that there is actually a lot at stake. Truly, a lot is at stake in this conversation. A colleague of mine uh, gives uh, the Marcionism quiz uh, to his unsuspecting undergraduates. And it consists of 10 uh, questions, uh, uh, 10 verses taken from the Old Testament all speaking about divine compassion and grace and mercy and deferral of judgment, and 10 passages from the New Testament, all speaking of divine wrath coming upon the sinners and all you blood of vipers and all that good stuff, all right? Now, what's interesting is that in my institution, all of those students failed the test. Now, of course, in your institutions, given the biblical knowledge of your students, nobody would fail the test. But, but it is not uninteresting that the kind of Marcion, Marcionite sensibility uh, is certainly underlying uh, this, sort of this, this undertaking. Um, so I think, uh, 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 just a quick comment on Professor Copan's uh, material. Uh, the notion of divine accommodation and divine pedagogy is very much a part of the patristic tradition, and it's an interesting question of how we handle the matter when we emphasize the issue of cultural embeddedness of scripture, and I would entirely agree that that's the case. We certainly don't want to push cultural embeddedness in the kind of direction of cultural relativism, so there is a, 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 a certain danger there that we both realize, and uh, there are, we have to find ways of dealing with this. Uh, now, since, of course, I was not Professor McGarry's a student in the Old Testament, uh, I might, uh, I might uh, forgive myself a comment on the question of the suspension of divine justice. Now notice, in Marcion's account of things, the Old, Old Testament God is not just the God of wrath, he's also the God of justice, and particularly retributive justice. And it's on those grounds, effectively, that he dismisses him. Aren't you actually making God something that, to some extent, less than the God 
as Marcion envisioned him by suggesting effectively that God suspends justice. And I'm sure, I'm sure that uh, good, a good answer could be provided uh, for that. So this notion of temporary suspension of justice is, is, a, is, is a matter uh, up for discussion. Uh, and then finally, uh, uh, for Professor Levering's uh, comment, uh, uh, the principal issue at stake, again, is the question of the fuller meaning of scripture or the discernment of the divine intention of scripture. I think we're all in agreement that this is our um, this is what we're trying, or we intend to find. The issue, of course, is this, how does one go about it? And so whether, for example, something like canonical criticism or rather the notion that you have to take scripture as a whole, whether that would carry the day, I tend to side with Professor Copan, and that is that certain important perfect being intuitions and metaphysics uh, partic in particular is simply inescapable in the process of trying to discern uh, the language of scripture. And so in that regard, uh, now of course the perfect uh, being uh, intuitions have to be still in many ways refined by what scripture has to offer. They have to be constantly, if you will, um, tested uh, by the totality of the scriptural witness. And yet, uh, and yet it seems to me that the kind of inescapability of metaphysics is something that probably we and Dr. Levering would, could agree on. Thank you. As they uh, take down the podium, we're going to just stay here, and I'm going to read some of the questions here from the, the audience and from Twitter that we've received. And I thought maybe what I would do is uh, work my way from left to right and allow them to answer the question. And if anybody wants to chime in on that, feel free, and otherwise we'll just uh, keep going. Uh, so, um, uh, Paul, even if we can assume that God is perfectly just and perfectly good. How would such a view inform your reading of a passage like the ban in, jo uh, in uh, Joshua? And the passage in question would be the ban on the, the, the material in chapter, the material in chapter seven, or? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm mm -hmm. thinking, of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems to me, again, the fundamental point seems to remain the same, and that is that we're not dealing simply with an outburst of emotion. As my undergraduates would ask me, uh, is God is simply mad at us? Okay? Uh, and so the issue is that whenever, and this is actually, this is truly quite consistent, at least out of 200 passages in the Old Testament that speak of divine anger, all of those passages occur in a moral context. So whatever else could be said about this, so this is very different in this regard from the, for example, anger of the gods in Enumai Elish, where the idea to wipe out humans comes as a result of simply humans getting too loud, too noisy, and simply annoying the gods. Now that's a trivial, that's an instance of a trivial moral context. Scripture clearly casts the language of divine anger in the moral context. We still might have certain scruples with the, the way in which uh, the text unfolds, and in which case I would have to rely on the divine accommodation uh, material, on divine accommodation theory. Anybody else would like to? All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Levering. Um, when considering the whole counsel of God's word, how does one arrive at an understanding of God that precludes interpreting difficult judgment passages literally? So uh, on, on this question, um, in terms of difficult judgment passages, again, I, I call for um, trying to be as specific as possible uh, about what, we're, what, what passages we're talking about because, because I, I certainly would want to um, interpret a number of difficult judgment passages quite literally. But, but again, I, I want to go back and just say um, my, my point really was what, what if we were having this um, d debate next year over whether God um, has a body or is bodily. I'm not talking about um, our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm, I'm talking about the divine nature. And so, um, you know, a, fr a friend of mine, um, you know, uh, Stephen Webb has written a book on this topic, um, arguing that God is bodily and as a, from a Christian, as a Christian theologian. 
and, and so have others, of course. And so if we were to then have a, a debate about whether God is, uh, has a body, and I do think that there are a number of passages in Scripture um, that raise um, this concern or raise this possibility. So how would we go about um, sifting those passages and evaluating them? Um, and and my, my point really is this, we do it the same way that we do with this question, really. You know, so, but, but of course, um, I, I think that, that the, um, you know, the moral element would not be present there. So it's, it might be easier for us to, to handle um, the whole issue of whether God is, is bodily. We can handle that in a, in a way that, that would not maybe be as intense. But, but that, that's, that's how I would answer the question is that we um, watch what we do when we, when we think about that question. And then that's what we ought to do for this, for this question. Right, uh, uh, Dr. McGarry. Is, quote, unconditional righteousness, unbought devotion, a possibility for post Eden man? This person is suggesting that instead of, instead, uh, God desires love from humans, love without bounds. Is it possible for post Eden man to be what you described as unconditionally righteous? <clears throat> well, the point of the test was not whether Job loved God. Um, there seems to be, there seemed to be a dispute going on up somewhere. And the Satan, who has a very low view of humanity, and I, I, I use the Satan uh, because I, I, don't, uh, I don't accept the idea that it is Satan for all kinds of reasons, which will now produce another question. Uh, <laughs> but um, the Satan maintains that people don't do anything for nothing. Uh, God raises the issue of Job. What about Job? Satan goes, you can't use him. Look at everything you've given him. No wonder he serves you. Uh, take everything away, and then you'll, you'll see. So the Satan essentially is putting himself, uh, he's trying to help God out just so that God isn't deceived, thinking people uh, serve him and are committed to him for, for no reason. So the tests work their way through. Um, we have the loss of, of property and family. We have the loss of physical well-being in round two, and I believe round three is uh, the assault made on Job's theology by the friends, who, if Job were to give in to their constant pleas, there's got to be something wrong. There has to be hidden sin. They start out by saying, at least you're not dead like your kids. So that whatever you did didn't cost you your life. And then they work their way up to think real hard. Bad things happen to wicked people. Uh, so, and we're not saying you're wicked, but, but think really hard. Is there any unconfessed sin in your life? Because God wouldn't just be doing this for no reason, which is ironic. Uh, the question is even asked about there's, whether it's without cause. It's interesting on the rhetorical questions in the book because the right answer is always the wrong answer. So they can't come up with anything, so by the time we get into the third round, they have to start making up sins for him. And they accuse him of doing things that, that nobody would have thought that he did. Uh, uh, taking, ripping the, 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 the mantles off of uh, street people and taking bread out of urchins' hands which isn't really that Job did that, but now they're going after him for sins of omission because there has to be something that, they, that he did because God cannot be doing this for no reason. But God can't enter into the, into the process. Job has to, has to bear this on his own. So all the way through, he is not understanding. He's crying out to God, uh, you made me. Why are you treating me like this? Uh, and as I said, he keeps talking to God. And it's the defenders who were in deep hot water at the end of the book, not Job, who apparently spoke what is right of God. So the issue is God believes that there is 
the possibility in post-Eden, Job's not perfect, he's not sinless. He never claims to be that way. But Job is unremittingly committed to God, regardless of what he has, regardless of what is done to him. He said, you can kill me if you want when, you're come, when you come, but I am going to stay right here and I will wait for you. So I think the answer is absolutely yes. Job is an instance of that. And I believe that there are instances of that, though the one thing of all of my theses, we can't really know the answer to any of them. Because only in this instance are we allowed to peek behind the curtain. But I suspect this goes on all the time. All the time. I don't go around picking out people and thinking, oh, you must be one of those that, uh, that's uh, under the duress of God. I certainly don't think, wow, what sin did you commit that brought this on? By the same token, um, uh, the fact is, God trusts Job. And I'm convinced that the lack of conflict, the lack of suffering in a person's life is not necessarily good. I have to wonder, does God trust me? Um, let me, there's another question that's sort of related to that one. Let me follow up with that. The philosophers have a, a, a law called the unexcluded middle. Uh, you, you, uh, one person asked here, if, is God necessarily just? Which we would normally have a knee-jerk reaction, well, yes. If so, then it, is, then it isn't even possible to be unjust. You seem to have a third category, suspending justice in this case, uh, but the law of excluded middle doesn't allow that. He is simply being unjust. Uh, how, would you, how would you handle that? Yeah. Did you have a reference in Scripture for the un excluded middle? Or? <laughs> no, it's... Uh, it's, it's what uh, Dr. Copan calls common sense. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, there, it, there's a problem there. Um, and I don't, like, I don't like the position that I've, the point that I'm at, the conclusion that I've reached. But uh, I, can't, I can't ignore grammar and syntax. I can't disregard the language. And I do see, throughout the book, the book of Job affirming God's justice. The, whole na the, the, the nature speeches focusing on God's power, which I would understand to be not sort of outbursts, but uh, demonstrations that, that God is overall in charge. Uh, that, as well as the fact that he says, uh, 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 Matthew even quoted, uh, he tells Job, you don't have to make me out to be rasha, wicked in order for you to be in the right. So this is one thing that Job does working from his situation, drawing conclusions about God. The friends are starting with their idea of what God is like and drawing conclusions about Job. Both of them are in trouble, but the friends are in much more trouble uh, because of, of, of God's response. So um, I, 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 I do think um, to find a way uh, for there to be uh, an accommodation for what clearly happens in the account and to maintain what I believe the book maintains, and that is God's justice. The idea of the temporary suspension of justice, the local suspension of justice, where God continues to be just as he normally is, except at this time and in this place for the purpose of this test because of how important it is, not for the Satan to know, but for us to know that God desires this unbought, unconditional righteousness. There's that temporary suspension. Um, I, I appreciate, uh, Paul, your, your uh, 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 linking me with Marcy in there. That was, uh, I've never had that happen before, but it's, I, I will think about that. I, I, I'm, I'm grateful. That's going to make me think some more. But uh, I was just linking you with Pelagius almost. Uh, um, yeah. Last question. Yeah. yeah. I, 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 I would just jump in here. Um, it's kind of it's it's interesting, Dennis, that you were um, talking about. Well, where's the line you're drawing to keep you from slipping into relativism? I suppose the same question could be asked about your position. Um, but but I do think that there is this overriding uh, kind of supreme emergency, if you will, where you do have a, a distinctive setting where God has certain overriding reasons for not operating according to uh, a certain pattern that he typically does. So it's not as though it's without 
purpose, um, Job is innocent, and so yes, it is you know, without cause in that sense, but, but you can also think teleologically about a certain purpose that God has in mind for, you know, as you said, for our benefit. There is, uh, it, it's not as though it's just uh, out there and oh well, uh, it's just like uh, some quantum particle uh, popping, uh, you know, popping up. Uh, it, no, it, it's something much more principled, much more goal-oriented. Uh, it, it's not just uh, you know, sheer arbitrariness here. I mean, I, I certainly didn't mean to make the notion of the suspension of, of justice simply completely uh, irrational or, if you will, guilty by association. I mean, it's certainly, for example, in a variety of versions of kenotic Christologies, the notion of a suspension of a particular divine attribute has a role, and I'm not going to go in that direction, but in general that's not uh, an implausible notion. Now, I think uh, you made also a comment that in a sense divine mercy uh, could also be an instance, seen as an instance of a suspension of justice, but only for the sake of a higher, if you will, in a sense of perhaps, I mean, that's not quite your words, but it's interesting, Origen, when Origen responds to Marcion, uh, because Marcion can either have a God who is a God of retributive justice, or this wonderful New Testament God that's God of grace and mercy, and he can't quite fathom the two. Origen's response to that is actually that mercy without justice is sheer arbitrariness, that actually justice establishes the baseline, and subsequently on that, one can only build the attribute of mercy. So Origen actually argues not simply for some sort of tension within God between the, the two attributes that need to be reconciled, but actually for the claim that uh, justice is what makes then mercy uh, morally meaningful. That's that's at least that's that that's the claim. Of course, that's my argument from authority too. So, yeah. Oh, I, I just want to add also that um, on this, it it seems to me that um, the the end has to be just. God's purpose has to be just, and so so also does the means have to be just. What what God does have to be what God does has to be just. Doctor uh, Copan. It is true that God caused suffering to Job. However, there is a difference between bringing suffering directly and between commanding others to bring suffering. I think people have more problems when God commands humans to kill versus God killing directly. And they point to, uh, you know, the uh, exodus and so forth as, you know, seems perfectly acceptable. It's precision strike. God knows what he's doing. But when you're commanding other uh, human beings to do it, it has collateral damage. Their psychology, for one, and other other things. How would you, how would you respond? It damages, to as in, it damages those who are actually carrying this out, et cetera. Um, and, and it's imprecise. It's it's they're going to make mistakes. They're sort of blanketing uh, the area, as it were. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose on some of those questions, the uh, basic uh, principles that we would apply to. Uh, just war thinking would be uh, in in order, um, but but I'm not saying that this is a parallel case. But I think in some of those things about, say, the trauma that it brings to the soldiers who are engaging in this uh, kind of activity. Uh, well, I mean, psychiatrists do that sort of a thing with uh, sexually abused patients and so forth, and they enter into their world, and this can be damaging and traumatizing to them and so forth. We don't say, oh, you shouldn't do that because that sort of a thing happens to you. No, there's, you know, there are instances of courage and bravery where people, you know, enter into uh, another person's world and, and they end up kind of like Frodo in the Lord of the Rings being damaged uh, in the midst of all this, but still it is, a, it is an important work that needs to be done uh, even though there, are, there is that kind of damage that, uh, that does come. Uh, but more to the, the question about, uh, well, well, what about um, God not just um, you know, uh, acting through these, uh, these soldiers or uh, through this uh, warfare? Um, well, you know, you know, why not just act directly? Well, again, that's, yes, it would be a lot tidier for God to act uh, more, uh, more uh, directly. But I think we are pushed back to the question, if there is such a command, I mean, remember, it's a, it's a two-phase sort of thing. God is commanding them to, be, to, to drive out or to dispossess them, and any of those who would be left uh, 
behind or would stick around, be foolish enough to stick around, they leave themselves vulnerable. Of course, the, the people who would be the first to go would be women and children. Uh, but if you're driving them out, you're not killing them. I mean, David was driven out from the presence of Saul. Adam and Eve driven out from the garden. Uh, they weren't killed in that process. And so, uh, so there are a number of tensions that are involved in the, in the language here uh, as well. Uh, so there's a lot to unpack. Um, you know, the, the, the driving out versus the, uh, the killing, the, uh, the fact that you have people who have been utterly destroyed, but yet many of them are remaining behind. And then we're told that Joshua, you know, and especially in Joshua chapter 11, uh, that he is repeatedly commended for having done all that Moses commanded. Uh, well, you know, he's clearly, you know, you get to Judges 1 and 2 and you have, you know, these people who haven't been driven out after all. They are there to this day and so forth. So, so there, there, there are a number of different directions, a number of different tensions, and if you overemphasize one, you will, you will distort some of those other tensions that are in place. If you literalize one, you're going to do damage to other texts that go unanswered. Uh, but, but yes, it would, as I said, it would be tidier to be more direct, but God... Again, a just God who in particular histor salvation historical circumstances is issuing commands. He, being necessarily good, would have overriding reasons for commanding this. Uh, so, you know, as I said before, rather than in saying, oh, God is all good, therefore he couldn't have commanded this, rather than, right, we should flip it and say, if God is all good, if God is all wise and all knowing, then he, if he comm truly commanded this, then he would have had good reason for doing so. And you think about the kind of people that the Canaanites were and so forth, uh, you know, th I mean, there's a lot of stuff that goes with it. And, uh, and, and as I said, these people would be, uh, you know, the kinds of practices that this culture was engaged in would have, be, would have been, these would have been criminal, uh, criminal activities in any civilized society. So uh, keeping a number of things in mind, there's a lot to, a lot to juggle here. So um, <clears throat> I, I still think it's really important that we just keep it absolutely as concrete as possible. And so um, that was kind of, that's the gist of um, my argument, you know, and so for me, the, um, the text from 1 Samuel 15, 13, 15, 3, where um, God says, go smite Amalek, and, um, and then talks about destroy all they have and kill infants and suckling. And so um, to me, that's, that's just the heart of the matter right there is, um, you know, and I, and I, I just can't, I can't imagine not seeking, um, you know, to find um, ways, in, um, at, at simply asking um, what are the alternatives here for, what are the options? I mean, are there any options, are there any interpretive options here? Or, um, or, or really must we assume that, that um, God could, could command people like you and me to, to go kill other people's, um, just go enter some woman's home and go kill her baby? I mean, just think about it, you know, so it's, uh, to me it's unthinkable, but even if it were thinkable, I, I'm still wanting to think at least carefully about what the other options are um, for um, interpretation, because it, it's not clear to me at all that, um, that everything that is attributed to God, including making a sound in the garden and all that stuff um, that I mentioned, um, needs to be interpreted literally, so I'm not sure why um, I have to sort of presume that I need to interpret this literally. Um, but I, I'm not saying that I, maybe I'll be, in the end be forced back and, and really have to interpret it, um, that in fact, yes, God does want me to walk into that woman's home, me if I were an ancient Israelite soldier at that time, get, walk into the woman's home, take up her baby, watch her crying, and, and stab it in the heart or whatever. I mean, maybe I would have to conclude that. I don't think I would, though, but maybe I would. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not ruling out, but I'm definitely going to um, rule in many other options before I get to that um, point add to that, I mean, in, in the very text that you cited in 1 Samuel 15, it's interesting that just before that you have the Amalekites who just raided the Israelites uh, in 1448, and then you have Saul uh, actually carrying out what was told for him to do. I mean, they're in a citadel city fighting and the Kenites are told to leave, so you're probably not going to have women and children in there anyway. Uh, and then you have Saul saying that he had done all that the Lord commanded, and the narrator himself affirms in 1 Samuel 15 that Saul utterly destroyed them. But then you keep reading in the text, you get to 27 and 30 of 1 Samuel, the same book, and you have David engaging in 
warfare that covers the same territory. Uh, you know, he's fighting against an army of Amalekites, 400 of them escape and so forth. So it seems that there are, you know, there's a lot more going on here. And, uh, and you'll have, again, the hyperbole, you'll have, the, uh, you'll have just as in ancient Near Eastern war texts, where you'll have kings saying, you no, know, I destroyed them as though they had never existed. Uh, you know, those sorts of, uh, you, you know, ancient Near Eastern texts are rife with these sorts of, uh, these sorts of comments of hyperbole that, you know, we know are, are simply trash talk of the ancient Near East. That's wonderful, yes, I, I like all that, yeah, yeah what, what you just mentioned, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that we're pushing a little bit beyond the stated time, but I'm going to ask one more question that was given to everyone, and I'll start with uh, Dr. Gavriliuk, and if you guys want to just get your last word in on this, feel free to do that. Um, as Christians, can we read Noah and the Flood, or Moses and the Passover, Israel and the Canaanites, etc., apart from the cross of Christ? If so, how is it different? If not, how does the cross bear on this reading? And I think they have in mind both the, you know, the, the, the revelation of God in Christ, but also the fact that God is bent on establishing his church, you know, uh, and his people in, on this planet. And that, that aspect of, uh, as well. well let, me, let me just make a, an observation or so that, that on the one hand, each of the Old Testament stories uh, that were mentioned certainly has meaning uh, and could certainly be interpreted as independent pericopes quite apart from everything that happens in the New Testament. At the same time, I think the premise was, uh, can we do so as Christians? Uh, uh, most of these texts, including certainly Moses, uh, there would need to be a connection made uh, between uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, what that connection is would have to be unpacked in each individual case. Um, I think that the fundamental issue, actually, that this question raises is precisely Marcion's desire, if you will, to split uh, uh, the scripture into two halves that are completely incompatible and simply completely uh, um, uh, um, uh, eliminate uh, the Old Testament. And, and he did so with the book of Antitheses that he brought uh, to the Church of Rome, uh, complete with an equivalent of about $2 million. And, and the church said, thank you very much for your donation. We're not accepting it. Could you please take your elephant down the road? So it was an interesting uh, kind of uh, decision made. And uh, from that point on, it seems to me the two parts need to be integrated constantly in our Christian preaching thinking uh, and prayer. One thing I would say to this is that is that certainly we need to think about um, differences of genre between um, Old Testament, many Old Testament texts and, and then many New Testament texts because um, the New Testament texts, um, it does seem to me, um, their, their historicity, their, their historical reliability in terms of um, their um, the obvious intention to describe um, historical things that happen in history. Um, this, is, this is important to keep in mind and, and then to... Um, to, re to realize, of course, that the, um, the Old Testament texts can, can um, there are more different genres. Um, um, you know, for example, prophets and, and um, psalms and, and whatnot, but, but also more different genres even within, um, in, my, in my view, even potentially within um, history texts. So, I mean, it's, there is some difference, but um, so in terms of the question, um, specific question, uh, in terms of can we read it um, without Christ, well, um, no, I don't think we can, but, but, but I, I see the, um, the pressure point here in terms of whether we're going to allow the um, Old Testament scriptures integrity um, of their own and, and really give them attention um, on their own without, without first turning to, to Christ and then reading them in light of Christ. And, and, um, now, so I think, I think we should do both, essentially. We should do both. We should, we should read them in light of Christ, and then and we should also read them um, seeking their own integrity and what, what they meant and and intended to say in, in their own time, and um, and and so, so there, there. I think I think my position would be um, maybe different, say from Father John Bears, um, because he seems, as at least as far as I can understand his position, he seems to um, to begin with Christ, and then the Old Testament is simply um, material that we read to learn Christ, and and I think that might go a little bit too far, um, but nonetheless, I don't want to do without that though. I, I want both both ways of reading the Old Testament. And I would agree with you and not with Father John Baer. <laughs>
Mm -hmm. um, scripture is scripture. There is no inferior scripture. Despite what we do in our preaching programs, despite uh, keeping the uh, Old Testament in Sunday school and the New Testament up in the pulpit, scripture is all God breathed. And if we believe that, Marcion's should be dead and gone long ago. It's interesting how one of the, the driving motifs of the Old Testament is God's determination to bless all that he has made. And that never stops. And we can find a war here and we can find a problem here, but somehow we're, 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 we're not seeing the forest for the trees. From the very beginning, it was God's desire to bless. And bless keeps popping up. He wants to bless mankind. He wants to bless the monsters. He wants to bless animals. And it just keeps moving until ultimately we get to chapter 12 of Genesis where the specific articulation is made of more concretely how that blessing is going to be worked out. But God could have pulled the plug on everything earlier. And instead, when he tells... Uh, tells uh, everybody in those first 11 chapters, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And that's prefaced with God bless them by saying that keeps going. So that by the time we get to chapters 10 and 11, we have all these nations. Where in the world did they come from? Without recognizing this is the evidence of God's blessing upon his creation. God continues to bless. The problem is people don't want to make God their God though they continue to reap the benefits of the blessing. So as that moves forward, whether it's the flood, whether it is Genesis 22 or Sinai, whatever the event, it's all moving in the same direction. It's all moving toward the cross. It's moving toward that ultimate, precise, uh, uh, non-reversible finality of God's blessing upon all time and space that comes in the person of Jesus Christ, whom he, who he raises from the dead, sealing forever Satan's fate, and I don't mean the Satan, Satan's fate, <laughs> as well as the fate of all those who have corrupted humanity from the beginning. So uh, I, I, I like to keep looking forward. I want to have what I think scripture requires, and that is the anticipation rather than starting there and then going back as though I have to have what I have in the Gospels in order to understand anything in the first 39 books. Uh, uh, somehow, God revealed himself to the people in those early days through that word, whether it was prophetic or whether it was through Moses, whatever the, the means was. So... Um, uh, I don't want to have one with the out, without the other either. I just want to make sure we're going the right direction. Because thinking I've got to start here to go back and understand this is Marcionite. And I think I'll let my Hebrew professor have the last word. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, thank you all for joining us uh, here at Trinity for this great debate. Um, you guys are dismissed. Have a wonderful evening. Let's give these guys. And thank these guys too. Thank you so much for coming.